So hello and welcome to Retech and today we're going to continue with the Clive Sinclair machine theme and in the last part we covered the clones, the machines that were sanctioned or otherwise by Sinclair Research and were built around the world and they cover a large proportion of the planet when you think about how many countries they penetrated into and that includes Sinclair Research models his licensed models and also the unofficial Sinclair models and um, you know for that reason it almost became a world computer it wasn't far off when you kind of start counting the amount of countries that his models or his clones or his sanctioned and licensed products actually entered into but in saying that there was still another model which most people really haven't seen or heard about or have only had fleeting images of it through internet searches and so on and that is this model here this Sinclair ZX Spectrum but it's the Argentinian model and it uses the same case as the Timex Sinclair 1500 with the louvers on the top although the 1500's got a silver case but that's really the only difference in the case the colouring is identical the, the way it looks, the way it feels, the, the vents, the grill, the whole lot it's like it was used or the case was used in Argentina to make these machines Maybe it was a licensing deal, but you know, there's not very much information on the Sinclair ZX Spectrum as it's written here. But again, it's a Sinclair licensed product. It uses the same system boards, it uses the same keyboards, it uses the same casing, the same faceplate, it has exactly the same sockets on the back and for all intents and purposes it's exactly the same machine it's got the beeper speaker in it there's been no additional changes to it and it runs and operates exactly like the Sinclair ZX Spectrum 48k the standard model so Sinclair did very well out of the ZX Spectrum with licensing and this is not all of them because there were also a lot of clones and I'm not sure if they were sanctioned or not by Sinclair because the actual company it was very tight-lipped on a lot of the clones that were being produced. So yeah, that was the Argentinian version of the ZX Spectrum and you know it did really well. It kind of used mix and match parts and it is a very rare machine today but it wasn't just those clones that were kind of going to look at today because in the mid 1980s Clive Sinclair got into a little bit of financial trouble he had a really good line in the ZX Spectrum it was doing really well it made a lot of money for Clive and his company and it sold millions of machines but combined with the downturn of sales in the UK because by that point almost everybody who wanted a ZX Spectrum or a computer or whichever model they went for had actually bought one so sales of the Spectrum have slumped in December 1983 every child wanted one for Christmas and by December 1984 every child who wanted one had one there are currently some 600 home computer manufacturers in Britain how many of them will still be around by this Christmas well, certainly less than 600, that's for sure. There was only a kind of finite number of people you could sell to without incrementally upgrading the machine every few years. And that was causing Clive a problem because he didn't have an incremental upgrade really to the, the ZX Spectrum, either in its 48 or plus models. And because of this, he, um, he struggled a bit to bring in, keep on bringing in the finances to keep his company going but also he was leeching money because of his C5 project which was 
leaking money at a huge volume, at a huge rate, and he also had a very lacklustre Sinclair QL. The QL, or quantum leap computer, designed for the upper end of the market, has been dogged by production and marketing problems. From next week, the Sinclair QL, now priced at just under £400, is to be reduced by 50%. And although Sinclair originally promoted this machine as being capable of more serious applications, it failed to make any inroads into the business computer market. Now the Sinclair QL, which we've covered in a previous video, was not a huge success in any shape or form for Sinclair research. And it wasn't because it was technically a bad machine, it wasn't because of the general specifications of the machine itself. It was because of some of the quirks that Sinclair Research designed into the machine. Okay, so this here is the Sinclair QL and it's very Spectrum 48 plus and 108-esque with its black styling, similar keyboard, which is, as you can hear, has a much better tactile response than the 48K models, or the 128K model for that matter. And um, generally, the, the specs of this machine really meant it should have done very well. I mean, it had built-in telecommunications properties on this machine. It also had power RGB networking on a machine of this era which was practically unheard of and you know you, because you had a serial port it was easy to access modems and so on and they turned this into also into a one per desk for ICL for telecom use um, and it wasn't an overall too bad a machine the problem was if you stopped here if the machine stopped at this point and didn't have these micro drives on them it would have po probably been a much much better machine I mean it has the same style heatsink as the original 128 and it's overall packaged very similar to the Spectrum 128 now compromised because micro drives the Keyboard, although it is infinitely better than the Spectrum Plus and 128 Plus models, it's still not exactly standard. It's more style over function, but you know, it does look nice. And um, this machine was not a raging success. It came out at a point where people were going gooey. Graphical user interfaces, point and click. This still had an old school basic interpreter and it was all line commands and keyboard commands that actually got the software running and the work done on the machine so it was a little out of step from the kind of more professional market and the more kind of affluent hobbyist market so we'll say because this was pitched at the cost that ended up being the cost of an, a Commodore Amiga not long after this so again it was a bit of a misstep so he wasn't doing particularly good and then to compound this his distributor went bankrupt owing him millions of pounds so eventually he had to look for a partner or a buyout and originally Richard Murdoch was on the scene but that really didn't come to much and most people think it was a bit of a delay tactic and eventually Alan Michael Sugar from Amstrad bought the Sinclair brand so he bought the rights to the Sinclair models and the, the, basically the name and the brand and in true Amstrad style he set about cost reducing them and kind of improving them in some respects as well but Amstrad had always had a reputation for producing kind of middle of the road products but at a very cost reduced price and they weren't shoddy in you know kind of the fact that you get some strange and weird kind of shoddy goods from certain parts of the world today they um they were actually reasonably well built 
they weren't top of the range they weren't all singing all dancing although they looked like they were and he got a foot in that kind of market and he did really well out of it whether it was hi-fis or electric goods or anything that he actually turned his mind to he made into a success so he took the Sinclair brand he took the ZX Spectrum one of the best-selling computers at the time and he decided to change it now he took the original 128 plus 128 board and slightly re-engineered it and he basically came out with the Grey Plus 2. And this is that model. And the improvements were actually very good. You had a decent keyboard. You also had a data corder as you put it on the side. But I was kind of hoping at the time it would stop here and just be a computer where you could run a separate cassette drive to it or disk drive but he combined it all in one as in a very similar vein to his Amstrad CPC range you could see where he was coming from um, it ran 128 48k modes on this as well so you could run virtually the entire stock of Sinclair software and the original grey model has a 128 plus style board inside of it okay there, there are a few changes to it but most of them were in kind of the vein of cost reducing it and this one became a decent model it was very compatible with the original zx spectrum range and also a nice advantage of the keyboard which is very very good now the downsides for one of these was is really you couldn't use it in 48k mode if you wanted to do any kind of software writing because there were no legends on the keys so all of your commands well you had to try to remember where they were on the keyboard itself which was almost impossible really uh, so it really virtually became a 128 model or a games model and this is where he pitched the model it was at a home system games machine so it was pitched at the point where Clive Sinclair really had the spectrum but he didn't believe it was just a games machine where Amstrad believed it was a games machine now clone is probably the right word for these because they aren't original ZX spectrums they are a clone of the original ZX spectrum but improved so they are still really for want of a better term a clone of the 128 plus although slightly improved in keyboard and a built-in cassette and you know audio reset buttons joystick ports um, everything seemed to be kind of ergonomically worked out rather than just pushed into a case and kind of second thoughts of where you were going to put stuff but that was Amstrad's strength he was very good at packaging and which is what most of his products were repackaged other items later on he brought out the black plus two which was completely re-engineered it had a re-engineered board it was cost reduced again and it also had a few issues with compatibility or a few more issues with compatibility but generally most of the software would work on this machine and it wasn't a bad machine in itself but again it was a, really another clone of the original 128 plus to be honest it was an Amstrad variant of the original machine now Amstrad had this quest of cost reducing all the time or getting the most value out of the original ZX Spectrum and to that end he did really well with it I mean he did push this and these, these machines lived so much longer than their kind of sell by date and they were even kind of being sold in certain stores into the early 90s that's how long these machines were, were around now my opinion of these are they're kind of very similar to some of the the Russian clone machines out there because the Russians had Spectrum plus one to eight versions of the original Sinclair ZX Spectrum with 
proper keyboards with a decent case with a more robust feel and really that's where these models were really they were much more robust than the original 48 and 128 plus and they had more of a a quality feel about them even though they they cost less to make i think these were being sold for about 130 pounds at the time which was a little bit of a drop compared to the original plus 128 so he got his marketing right now the final model that came out of clive sinclair's brain or clive sinclair's willingness to produce more models for the home computer market or the business computer market was the cambridge computer z88 and it's a nice looking machine it's got a chiclet style keyboard it might look like the hard plastic sinclair ql and zx spectrum 48 128 keyboard but it's more akin to the zx spectrum in kind of fit finish and concept but he got it spot on with this keyboard because it feels nice it types really nice it's nice to use it's actually not far away from a modern keyboard or even um, an apple keyboard or a dell flat cubed or flat squared keyboard similar to this and it feels very much the same it doesn't really feel chiclet style or rubber keyed because it was well thought out and because it was well thought out and it's a nice machine to use it's quite light in fact it's very light and it was designed more for the business market for more of a serious market as clive sinclair would always kind of put it and it made a nice machine and it was very well thought out um it had video out on it it had a good battery life over 10 hours on standard batteries and in the front it was able to take eproms and memory expansion so again you wouldn't really lose any data on this okay because it could be stored on a solid state system but it went up against the amstrad version of this basically which had a standard keyboard and um, it also kind of did better on price it did better in sales and this was virtually in a kind of a one-off failure for um, his or Clive Sinclair's latest company Cambridge Computers because it wasn't a raging success again because he was trying too hard this is what the original or was close to the original idea for the sinclair ql that he could get and this was after the sinclair ql the technology wasn't quite there for the ql and to be honest it wasn't really quite there for this this machine the z88 because the screen was a little small again it used basically command lines for a lot of this stuff you had to do on it so basically it wasn't point and click it wasn't intuitive you had to read the manual and the manual for this thing was pretty hefty and this is the manual just for the onboard software which was kind of par for the course for the day but at the end of the day people were moving away to a more of a point and click kind of situation only a few years after these machines were introduced so these seem to be or this type of machine seemed to be a stopgap um clive sinclair didn't see it that way he kind of saw it as a business machine which it was fully capable of being it wasn't a bad machine it just wasn't but you've got clive sinclair who just sold his company to amstrad he set up another computing company Cambridge computers he couldn't use his own name on this um, and he had a bit of an image problem mainly because of the ZX Spectrum and the failure of the QL which was the biggest one and also his electric car which we it's been covered enough but again he had a bit of an image problem and that it was it was far far ahead of its time because 
that's where people are moving to today fully electric vehicles so yeah it was a bit ahead of its time but it wasn't that well thought out so yes i actually like this machine um it's one of the nicest kind of put together products that came out of any of the clive sinclair stables it's um nice to use it was pretty well thought out it was just slightly too it was just the image problem and it was also because it came out of the QL and Sinclair C5 stable, which is probably why it didn't gain as much traction as it should have, but it deserved to do better, really. It was quite a nice machine. And out of the Amstrad NC, the, the little Amstrad notebook, and this, um, I prefer this machine. It's lighter, it's better built, it seems more integrated, it has a lot more styling to it and a better style to it and it does exactly what you want it to do for the time and you've got to think for the time there was not anything out really to kind of rival this kind of machine at the time until Amstrad came along but again a little bit ahead of its time some people would say but I like the machine and I'm glad I've got one so that was the last machine that Clive Sinclair or the last computer that came out of the Clive Sinclair stable the Cambridge computers Z88 so that's a look at the Clive Sinclair models from the clones to the Amstrad days so I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you will subscribe and join us more on this channel so thanks for watching and I'll see you soon